Thank you very much for, for those kind words. Kia ora tata, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, te mihi nui o te ra. And greetings to you all and, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. There were some fantastic and very interesting speakers yesterday and I'm very proud to be amongst them and to have the chance to share with you some of the things that I've gleaned over 35 years of working in the field. Uh, started life in the education and I was a teacher who did not give the hand of opportunity to the children who were displaying behaviours that might have indicated that they were needing some help or being abused or neglected. And uh, over the years, uh, that has sat with me quite strongly. I then became a child therapist, a play therapist, and then um, seeing the need and the founding chief executive of Child Matters. And I like to uh, just let you know that I've got some of my wonderful team here and one of them is doing a, a, a workshop this afternoon. Um, I'm going to, now I'll just click and see. Do I have to point it somewhere? Here we go. Uh, look at some of the current child protection issues today, some of the incidents and impact and issues, uh, approaches and particularly what I really want to do is to share an awareness uh, program that I think is unique to New Zealand and that one that has an exciting future. Look one way. How's that? <laughs> um, so, I'll get the technology right. I believe as a society we do fail our most vulnerable. In New Zealand, across the society, not present company accepted, we do have a high tolerance for, for violence and too many of us are ready to look the other way. And very often this is simply because the individuals don't really understand the ramifications and the manifestations of child maltreatment. I want to look at how we can change that. It's time that we made a decisive change for children and I was looking at the, the title of this conference and I thought what a great opportunity given the, the nature of the, um, the use of the world crisis. It's an opportunity to make this a turning point for our children, for a society that views its children differently. Most of our children we know are doing pretty well. But imagine a country where every child is safe and healthy and getting all they need to develop to their potential. Imagine that they are nurtured and get what they require. Imagine that every child grows into an adult who's able to make a positive contribution to family, community and society and the nation. You know, Northern Ireland is about the same size as New Zealand, about 4.6 million people. And it's had its fair share of stresses, the troubles, <coughs> inter internal unrest, uh, financial crisis, and yet they protect their children much better than we do. And if New Zealand had had the same rate of child maltreatment and deaths of Ireland as Ireland over the period of the uh, UNICEF report, we would have had 41 children out of our 55 saved that died in that period. So what is it that they do? There's a huge body of knowledge around the, how to help ensure children have an opportunity for healthy growth, growth and development, how to prevent adverse childhood experiences from ever occurring in the first place. There's so much more that we can do to support the healthy development of our tamariki, our mokopuna and our little ones. So it's become increasingly obvious in all of the literature, and there is so much evidence out there, that what we need is a comprehensive, collaborative and coordinated approach. That's nothing new to any of you, you've been hearing it all the time. We need to implement this through partnerships of citizens, professionals and all parents, anybody involved in the community. So we know what children mean, need, and by that I mean the literature is there, the research is there, it's absolutely clear. The literature is full of accounts and evidence of the effects and stress on the developing brain. And I'd like to commend Brainwave, 
for the fantastic work they've done in bringing that knowledge to New Zealand and to New Zealanders and making us so aware of that here. We know about the effects on children where interactions with caregivers are negative, erratic, unpredictable or entirely absent. The attachment process will not occur and profound and enduring effects uh, are long lasting for a child. We know parents and other caregivers require economic resources to provide their children with proper nutrition, adequate housing, sufficient health care. We know that poor children begin life with a disadvantage and it's very difficult to catch up. We know that education is often cited as one of the ways out of poverty. Yesterday, there were some wonderful speakers talking with a focus on how children and families were impacted by poverty. So my focus will be on the impact of child abuse, but many of those um, attributes and outcomes will cross over when we look at how we can do better for our kids. So for those of you who don't live in this world, I'm going to just uh, remind you and put the current situation into perspective using a quick selection of New Zealand data and information that most of which has come through Child, Youth and Family or the Office of the Children's Commissioner. But as the slide says, we actually don't know how big this, um, this, this problem is. We do know that it's just the tip of the iceberg, that the part that we see. And these are some of the things that we see. You, know, um, you can have a look at those, but I'll talk. Comparatively, though, we don't have a good record. In 2003, there was a seminal UNICEF report that, that gave us the ranking of third worst in the 27 OECD countries, or sixth worst um, if we took an undetermined to 10 of the deaths of children uh, through violence. We see that 15%, that according to the Children's Commission, of newborns are born vulnerable. With 60,000 births a year, that's 9,000 kids every year that are vulnerable. And Nicola Atwell yesterday said she believed that that was quite underestimated. So, and people, as I said, are always asking whether the problem is getting worse or whether we're doing better. And it's a very difficult one to answer because on the one hand, even though our tolerance for violence is high, it is lessening. With um, changes to some of our laws with the Section 59, the smacking law, it's made people think a little bit about their violence towards children. And so we, it, we think of more actions as being abusive, particularly in the physical violence field. There are hundreds more service providers out there than there were 35 years ago when I started in this field. So there are a lot more people uh, talking about it. There is a lot more action happening. But we simply don't know how many adults have lived their whole lives without talking about what happened to them. And you're probably in the same situation as my team is, that when people find out what you do, that's actually an invitation to share something. And whether it's the man selling insurance in my office or whatever, we hear the most interesting stories of people who've never shared before. So if we don't know how big it was, even knowing how much we think it is today, it's a difficult one to answer. But does it actually really matter in the scheme of things? It's our kids and what's happened to them that we really need to consider. This is a, a child-centric model of child abuse and it acknowledges the four types of abuse that we're talking about. So I've mentioned physical abuse but what we see is the interaction of physical, sexual abuse and neglect very often coexisting and always existing in the framework of emotional abuse which is the long term insidious um, abuse of children that has such a profound effect. It recognises too that child abuse occurs both within and outside the family, 
and also the role that intimate partner violence, particularly in family violence, has on children and emotional abuse and neglect. I like this model because for me it ensures that we don't lose the focus on the issues and needs of children. You heard, would have heard yesterday that in the year ending 2012 there were about 151,000 notifications to child, youth and family, 65,000 of which needed extra uh, attention and about 21,000 of which were substantiated uh, abuse cases. So it's interesting to look at where the reports came from. And for me, they indicate the confidence that each of these sectors has for whatever reason, and that's another whole story that we won't go into today, um, in making notifications. And it's important to bear that matter in mind, I think, when considering how we encourage people to intervene at an even earlier stage. And that's really where I'm heading today. What is also particularly interesting, I think, is the low reporting rate for education, considering the time that children spend in schools and early child care centres. We're probably well aware of the um, Garabino in model that was introduced way back in the 70s to see children involved with family, as part of communities and as part of society. These, this is um, a model that looked at the determinants of abuse to children and it suggests that there is not one cause of abuse but actually a whole host of issues happening at once that um, result from the joint influence of all of those sectors. That these are family, community and in the social structures. But it's it's also important to notice that the model's not static, that a family doesn't live in isolation. People who work in the legal centre, people who work in service providers are still families. So your interactions between those areas um, will continue. But what is also interesting and important to know is that while this is these are the determinants of risk, there are also the ways that we can mitigate against it. We know that, com that communities and neighbourhoods can affect the safety of children. We know that, children, that families at risk can bring up their children safely, successfully, when they are in communities that can support and help them. So I want to look a little bit about why this is such an important piece of work to do. And and nothing I'm really going to tell you in these next couple of slides is, is new. But it's about the impact and it's about bringing it together in our thinking. Um, Timothy mentioned a book that we produced a couple of years ago where we interviewed uh, the 24 survivors of child abuse um, hidden in front of us. They told us about their lives and the effect that the abuse had on them long term. And one of them, actually, that's a quote, said, I could have been a brain surgeon. But the loss of potential, the lack of education, the lack of attention meant that he only became a school counsellor. I thought he did pretty damn well. Um, but and he has uh, a lot of other insights that he's been able to share with us. The issue of absence from school, and I know there's a paper about that which is, will be very interesting, and truancy for me is particularly important. As a member of the um, child, um, youth and, um, child, child and Youth Mortality Review Committee, the, the, the central body, we look at the causes of deaths of all children under the age of 24. And when I look at the, the graph, which is high in the first year or two, going down to about five and then rising again once the child hits about 12 through to those teenage years. And you look at how many children have died from overdoses, from violence, from um, suicide, from car accidents, motor vehicle accidents, even when they were passengers, or, you know, they weren't actually 
uh, aggressively doing something, the amount of times that truancy or school being stood down from school or school absence comes up is incredibly high. And I would say, in, in my very non-scientific uh, looking at that process, probably 90% of the time. So here is a flag that we can use to look and see what we can do for our kids. There are 30,000, I think, children average absent every day. So that's an area that is, uh, provides us with a flag. What can we do? What difference can we make for the lives of some of those children? People visiting a classroom, when you think of the discipline issues, when you walk into a classroom, you can tell immediately the kids who are not fitting in. They are either uh, not engaged or they're being disruptive or misbehaving. Um, these, these children tell us about their abuse through their behaviour. And the, the people in our book told me, my behaviour was the key. That's why I was acting that way. I wanted the attention. What did we get? We just got punished. When we asked them about people knowing about abuse that happened to them, they said, oh yes, people knew, the neighbours knew, the teacher knew, the doctor knew, but most often it was the teacher who knew. And we said, so um, what happened? Well, nothing. How did that make you feel? Well, it actually just reinforced the fact that I wasn't worth looking after or doing anything for. So that um, cycle and that, that pressure what was added to. If we look at the achievement, just this, this week or recently, um, the Centre for Social Justice in England has produced some uh, statistics that say children who suffer neglect tend to have lower grades, increased <coughs> absences, increased disciplinary problems and higher rates of school stand out. Over 50% of these children experience some kind of school difficulty for the abused children, attendance or disciplinary problem. 30% had a cognitive or language impairment, and 22% had evidence of learning disorders. And those who were maltreated as infants had the worst outcome by the age of five. So it was very obvious even from the time of starting school. So you know, it, it isn't rocket science, it isn't, it, it isn't surprising, isn't it? If you're hungry, you're not going to learn. If you're ill or in pain, you don't learn. And neither do abused and traumatised children. It's hard to concentrate when you've been awake all night wondering whether someone's going to come into your room and what you're going to say and do, how you're going to fend that off. It's hard to learn when you're wondering whether mum's going to be okay when you get home from work, from school today. Or whether dad's going to come home drunk and you're going to be hit again. Or whether there's going to be any tea or not. So if you can't concentrate and you can't learn, the outcomes are going to be um, a negative as we've talked. I just want to just bring you to your attention, many of you will be aware of this, but. I think this is one of the most important studies that's been undertaken in the last 10, 15 years. Over a 10 year period, 17,000 Americans who had health insurance, so these upkeep middle class Americans were part of a study called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And they looked at 10 adverse childhood experiences which included neglect, um, family dysfunction, abuse, family violence, having a parent in prison, a parent with a mental health issue. And these were their findings. The study note, noted that ACEs seem to account for one half to two thirds of the serious problems with drug use. And the more ACEs a person has, the more serious those outcomes are. There is an increase in likelihood that girls will have sex before reaching 15 years, and that boys or young men will be more likely to impregnate a teenage girl. 
It also said that adverse and childhood causes mental health disorders such as depression, hallucinations and post-traumatic stress, post stress disorders. Now, for me, this was a health study where they did physical examinations on these 10,000 people who then shared this enormous questionnaire. And it's one of the most comprehensive studies that's really validated what we've known from collections of information over the years. They summarised this study in a pyramid from conception to death, looking at the adverse experiences that uh, cause disruptive neurodevelopment, social, emotional and cognitive development, and then leads to the adoption of health um, and risk behaviours to, to lessen some of that pain of that um, traumatic experience. And these behaviours lead to disease, disability, social problems. And these people, middle class Americans, had actually earlier death as a result of the early childhood experiences and trauma that they suffered. And one of the interesting things for me was the high rate of heart disease, because I, I hear that New Zealand has one of the highest rates of heart disease um, in, in, in our group of OECD countries too. So just going back to the trust and relationship issues that come for, uh, for people who have survived child abuse, the participants in our book again um, and that research told us about the loss of self-esteem and the difficulty that they had in maintaining a relationship. They just didn't know how healthy relationships were. They also talked about um, becoming parents at a young age and um, the outcomes of teen parenting are, are also um, well noted. So while many teen parents have social support, um, the, um, the others have fewer resources and the cycle can continue. And we'll have a bit of a look at that. I'm just aware of time. And so again, the, the more Im impacts also are on violence and risk taking in adolescence. And What's interesting to note is that violence in adolescence is more highly correlated with being neglected for the first two years than it is to being uh, treated physically violently, which, which fits when you think about attachment and empathy and feeling that you're in control of your world and all of those things. <coughs> these, these outcomes actually seem to be uh, fairly universal um, even the, the American military is now saying that they believe that um, a number of the factors that are making it difficult for them to recruit into the military have their background in um, child abuse and neglect in the individual's life. And they're finding failure to graduate from high school, criminal record, physical fitness and obesity are causing difficulties. But what I liked about that uh, piece of information was that they were actually seeing the connection and starting to, to look at these impacts and think backwards about what caused them. One of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is the workplace because child abuse affects us all and it's quite interesting for people to think, well the workplace has nothing to do with child abuse and child protection and um, our treatment of children. But actually, it does. And our young man in our book told us that he wouldn't have lost his first seven jobs if he had had help and understood how to act in the workplace. When someone annoyed him, he bopped them, and then he got fired. So everybody in the workplace is affected when that happens. And they're affected when their colleagues use drugs or alcohol or come to work um, with uh, injuries that they've, they've received at home and can't do their work. So this is an area that we really want to, um, to look at a little bit more. But children who are abused, 
If their education level is low, are going to have trouble gaining employment, and the indications on the impacts for, uh, back that up, that the earnings are lower, the um, over the unemployment rate is higher, and the overall um, skill level of the jobs that people get is lower. Now, well, I've done a double one there. So that's probably saying to me that um, I need to flip over and get um, moving. But what I did want to just talk about is, before I go on to this one, is, is the next generation. Because the children who grow up to be the adults are more likely to be having children who will have a young parent, a teen parent who will be living in the lower, um, I was going to say, to living in poverty, but certainly will be living in the lower areas, not always necessarily in that, in that poverty group. They are more likely to have a parent in prison because of that um, generational um, process. They are more likely to be living in a family where the parent has partners. They are more likely to have a parent with a drug and alcohol and mental health problem or even not having a parent in work. And so the cycle can continue. What I want to look at is the, the spectrum of prevention. And it's quite clear that we need to work on more than one thing at, at a time. We need to be looking at influencing policy, looking at our organisations, fostering coalitions, educating our providers, and providing community awareness. And when we look at the Children's Action Plan, Many of these issues are addressed in that. We are going to be seeing some changes in the way we report and respond to child protection concerns, better screening and vetting, better sharing of information, <coughs> workforce training, um, and there are impending requirements for schools and other organisations to have clear child protection policies. It's the community awareness part of this spectrum that I want to look at in the last little while. This, when I think about what do I mean by community responsibility, I think of Tom Scott's cartoon. Um, this is the child that was abused. These are the parents of the child that was abused. These are the families and friends of the parents of the child that was abused. These are the neighbours and relatives of family and friends of the parents of the child that was abused. And these are the people who are blamed for the fate of the child that was abused. This cartoon is 10 years old. We've, we've had this around, we've been thinking about it. What have we done? How, why haven't we been able to harness the neighbours and relatives and friends and families of the child who's been abused? And to do this, I believe we need a primary-based prevention approach that looks before the services, looks at before the screening, and actually creates a society where, or a community that looks out for its children. A community that's, that is based in the shop, is the, part, is the bus driver, the, the neighbours, the church, the playground, sports club. So that all those people see it as their responsibility to help and protect children. And what's the barrier for that? Well, most adults are aware in a general way of what happens, but they haven't really A, made the connection with that impact that I was talking about, or B, seen it as something that they personally might be able to have um, an influence on. And when the problem seems, seems too enormous, it's really easy for people to believe that it's too big for them and there's nothing that they can do at all. And the, Certainly the theory of reasoned action will tell us that people are more likely to take action if they think it's the right thing to do, if they know it will have an effect, and if they think it will make a difference. And that's very true of the, um, the starfish story. And you will be aware of the little boy walking down the beach where there's been um, a pile of starfish washed up and he's throwing them back. And a man comes along and says, little boy, why are you trying to throw a starfish back. You won't make any difference. There's far too many. And the boy stops and thinks and picks up another starfish and said, well, I made a difference to that one. And the challenge is 
that to get a society where every member thinks that way. So I'm going to talk about a community event to raise awareness. And we know that when we change a community's beliefs and attitudes, we can make it safer for children. My team's been working uh, in Pitcairn Island, both have visited and they've done training with about 20% of the population there. Those children now in the last published report are as safe as children anywhere in, in the world or in any community. And these were children who was believed 100% of whom were sexually abused um, prior to the court case that um, brought that island into, uh, into everyone's um, consciousness. So I know there's going to be a workshop on community later in the day, but this is what I'm talking about community. Not about community services, not about agencies, not about um, interventions, but about each and every member that makes up our community. And it's called Buddy Day. It's about raising awareness and protecting all our children. So the first thing that we want to do is to get Joe Public to start to talk about it. So they start to think about, well, actually, this is something that impacts on me. There is something I can do about it. And this is what it is. This is what I can do. So this is a program, a project that's unique to New Zealand um, and has been held twice in Hamilton before and will be rolled out in Auckland, Wellington and Tauranga uh, next month. The concept is not new. The US uh, Prevent Child Abuse America has a pinwheel um, program, pinwheels for prevention, and they bring people together with the idea of preventing child abuse by using the pinwheel. So it's a, a way of getting the public talking. The, the picture there is 5,000 people in Times Square with pinwheels to get those conversations going with the people who are not those in this room but who think this has nothing to do with them. You know, children can't stop child abuse. Adults can. So the first step is to encourage those adults to think about what they can do to stop it. And what better way than to start these conversations about the well-being of kids than to send thousands of life-size cardboard children into the community with businessmen, politicians, iwi, members of the public. And that's what happens on Buddy Day, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the first thing is that... Oh, perhaps before I do that, I'll just tell you there, there are three themes and I'll look at the... Oh, it's done that again. How do I go backwards? There we go. The theme <coughs> one, the creators. These are the children. So a cardboard cutout like that is, um, is given to every school or every teacher who is interested in being part of the creation of the buddies. And these children breathe life in, into the buddies. They, they give them a name, a face, clothing, story, sense of belonging. And the buddies then become part of that school and that community. So I brought a few buddies along. This one's uh, Flaren, and he is from East Grove School. Now, I think we've got Amy over here. Is that one, Amy? Yeah, she's from Knighton School. And um, River is this little, dear little one. Can I just pop? Oh, River Tide, is it River, River Downs? And the one I had the first year had a mouth that sort of dribbled off the side and a strand of hair, and she was just beautiful. So you can see when you're a three year old, these little people are as big as you. And the kids really, really get attached to them. Then they take them um, on activities and take them for sleepovers, etc. They write about them in their, in their diaries and you can have a, have a look at those. 
So what happens is that, to work? is that there are conversations. So what's Buddy's name? Tell me about Buddy. Tell me about their stories. Who is Buddy? Who's their family? It creates conversations in the school for children to talk about themselves and, um, so, and about their ambitions. It creates an opportunity for children from different cultures to talk about their own experiences or um, children who have had unusual experiences as well and to empathise and learn about each other. So they're then encouraged, a bit like Roots of Empathy, I, I guess you know, that's a great complimentary programme, to empathise with Buddy. So what does Buddy need to be cared for? What would I like to be? How would I like to be treated? What do you do if Buddy's sad? How do we treat them? And so um, it's about helping them develop that early on in their lives. But I have an ulterior motive. I call it the McDonald's syndrome because McDonald's knows that if you get kids when they're young with happy meals, they will spend money at McDonald's when they're older because they associate McDonald's with good times. And same, similar with Enviro schools. We have got more young environmentalists coming out now than we've had for a long time because schools talk about environmental issues. If we can start developing this uh, empathy, this idea that we are responsible for our buddies early on, hopefully in another 10 or 15 years we'll have our young population coming out taking that sort of responsibility. Uh -oh, here we go again. See if I'm in the right. Yeah, this is, this photo is lovely. I, I've loved this photo. The school sent us this photo about Tama, and he, this was a new entrance class. Tama turned five, so we sang happy birthday. And the teachers get behind it too. So the second theme is the child ed educators, early childhood, and primary school teachers. They are supplied with. Uh, lesson plans and some ideas if they need that to supplement their own program. <coughs> um, they teach children about being unique and special. They might teach principles about cultural diversity or community <coughs> engagement. They will teach the values about respect, integrity, empathy. One teacher reported that she found two boys kicking Buddy. So she put them on the time-out mat for a while, then had a conversation with them and said, so, what happened? Now, you can't tell me that Buddy started this. <laughs> Which I thought was brilliant. And that actually engaged the boys. And um, they went back... Is this? They, they gave Buddy a kiss. Next day, they were out playing cricket and Buddy was looking after the wicket. And... <laughs> something had happened. They might teach key competencies about thinking, about relating to others, about participating in the community. They can cover the learning areas of health, um, PE, social sciences, English, language, and there's perhaps some new words that they can add to their word bank. Uh, personality, character, community, belonging. So there's a, a number of opportunities to do that they can do. Um, we also, they also learn to vote and, and to communicate. So where did Buddy get the name from? A number of schools will talk about that and with the children and actually have, have a consensus from them. Oh, I'm really going. So the teachers also get support for child protection. This is not an, this is not um, seen as with the goal of encouraging children to talk about child abuse, but we want teachers to be prepared if it makes them extra aware or if something does come up in the conversation. So we give them some resources to help in that regard. One, one of those is an example of what to do and how can you tell. So the third theme, and the original, I guess, the, the strongest premise, is the carers, and as I kept saying, these are the people who we want to engage who might not be engaged. The goal is to change their perception into 
one of, it is my responsibility, there's something I can do. So what can I do in my business? What can I do if I'm on the board of a sports club? What can I do if I'm a Sunday school teacher? What can I do, and my favourite, is if I'm in the supermarket and I see some child or family that needs help. So the buddy gets picked up and from the school and taken to a depot where a breakfast event is held and the carers come and pick up their buddies. Harcourts are our buddy couriers, they're out there with their cars. When they brought the buddies in the first time, we couldn't stop them talking. They, they took these little white things out and that was it, yeah, they did that. When they went to pick them up, transformed into River or Flarion or Amy, they just buzzed and they told us how the children wouldn't let them uh, take the buddy unless they had it strapped into the car and they checked to see that the buddy was buckled in. They exhorted them to look after them. They told them about how Buddy had been on a sleepover with them. They told them they wanted them to read their book. And when the Harcourts people came in and saw the enthusiasm of the children, they had that same enthusiasm themselves. So they bring them back and then on Buddy Day, we want our business leaders, our people of influence, um, it's not focused at the social service, health, education um, people, essentially. Uh, some of their leaders of influence, yes, but it's not another social work initiative. But there are messages. They're very simple, and it's a, the idea is that it's a fun project, that people will talk about things that they all have a part to play, something everybody can do, protection is the responsibility of us all, and if you worry about a child, speak up, and, and buddy, buddies come with little pamphlets about that with information to do that. So they actually take buddies everywhere. So if I wasn't talking about this, I would have brought um, my buddy here, and I would have said, look, this is Flamer, and I've brought him Today, he's going with me everywhere today to remind us all that it's uh, our responsibility to think about what we as individuals can do to make sure our children are kept safe. So they take them all over. Some of the cafes um, will give you two lunches for the price of one if you bring your buddy. So we're getting people who don't have buddies hooked into the same process. People are constantly taking photos, uploading it onto their Facebook or onto the website to tell everyone else where they are and what their buddies are doing. Um, and as I said, it opens up conversations. There was an IT group of young men who had a buddy and when that buddy got picked up they said, well it says on his book that he wants to be an astronaut, but we took him down to the server room and he's decided that IT is his thing. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't have thought they would have got into it. But what they did was that one of their mates had recently separated and they had a conversation that they wouldn't have had. They sat around the morning tea table and said, so how's it going? How are your kids coping? Is there anything we can do? And this invited that conversation that they might not have had. So Buddy even went to Parliament one year. We're hoping that every MP will have a Buddy next time. I thought this was interesting because here is a whole connector. There's 40 odd people here. This business has stopped. Everybody's come outside to have their photo taken. That's a commitment to this process by these people. And hopefully it will make them stop and think about other things that they can do. Um, to to treat children differently and think about children differently. I want a community where adults, all adults are aware of kids and their needs, where a mum with a pram is not a pain in the neck and you don't push around in front of her because she's in the way. Where um, there's a red square, I have this thing, excuse me, indulge me, a red square in every supermarket where you're allowed to throw a temper tantrum. And everybody knows if your kid's throwing a temper tantrum, the red square's there, that's fine, just, just indulge, don't worry. And um, 
the temper tantrum uh, will probably dissipate fairly quickly. So, so the, I mean, supermarkets have, there is so much potential of things they can do because so many families are, are at supermarkets in, in it's a stressful time. I want people to consider their buildings and how they can make them child friendly. And you think, well, that might be a big ask. But you know, Chow Hill have already been involved in this process and that's something that they want to introduce to some, they're an architecture firm in Hamilton and Auckland and they want to introduce that thinking to some of their clients. So Buddy goes to the bank, look at... <coughs> Craig sent us this, they wouldn't give their Buddy back for a week. These are investment people. <laughs> they are dry as, you know? And a week later, they sent us a picture of Buddy and said, look, um, our Buddy turned 13, so we had to have a birthday party for him. <laughs> a good excuse for a party, but um, that resonated very strongly. So, of course, Buddy Day is not going to stop child abuse. And as Bob Jones said, why on earth would you be involved with carrying cardboard cutout around? Why would that stop child abuse? It won't. It will start some conversations and it will start people thinking differently. I've just got to keep up because I've got little pictures on here. So there are our Harcourts team. One of the things that Buddy Day does is it starts new conversations. And Liz has been working with Harcourts um, and we've been doing some little seminars with them because they've come back and said, look, we've had our buddies, but you know it's got us thinking. We actually go into homes we see things that really disturb us and we don't know what to do about it. We just carry it around. Do we have, is there something we can do? So we've been working with them to help them take that responsibility. So last year there were about 75 childcare organisations and schools. There were 350 buddies uh, representing, 20 per, each one representing five kids um, of substantiated abuse cases in our region. Uh, we, we, we did some research and calculated with, you know, as, you, as Facebook tells you how many people you've been in touch with, um, and we figured there were about 11,000 conversations because what I didn't tell you is we go out and about, I'll say to you, would you like to sign the book to say that you think this is um, a message that you support? So we can also look at how many people have been impacted as I walk around during the day and sign the book. We um, did some research and found there was an 11% increase over the day in this town. So that's a pretty good start for a one-day social media, even if we've been, uh, oh, sorry, one-day project, even if we have been trying to focus on the media and what we can do. As I said, next year, this year coming up, um, the Governor-General is going to have a buddy. Gareth Morgan and the Phoenix are going to have a buddy and um, we'll be in Wellington and Hamilton and uh, Auckland as well as uh, Tauranga and there'll be 120 buddies. What people do in their communities is up to them. We provide the infrastructure and the community sorts it out for themselves. So there'll be a different buddy day in Tauranga from what it will be in the new market area. Um, Kerry Souter is New Zealand's what do we call it, extreme sport <coughs> champion. He ran through the mud on the Coromandel Peninsula to win an extreme sport event with Buddy on his back. So what he could do is do that and then blog about it in, with his sports friends. As a young dad, he believes <coughs> this is uh, quite important. So uh, Justine said yesterday, when you're looking at community events, you need some, um, some champions. So um, Shortland Street guys, and I think my IT's not working as it should. Um, Eric Money, Murray and Mahi Drysdale are some of our champions. Um, and so what we want is everybody acting as a champion for children so that we can have a nation where our children will flourish. You know, I've been banging on for 20 years about the need for child protection policies, vetting and screening, training, We've got a bill before Parliament. It only took 20 years, but it's happened. So let's hang in there. Let's work together to get a society where everybody cherishes its children. Thank you. Kia kaha.